Welcome back. So, I do not have the um, slide projector turned on, and that's okay. Um, how many of you here have submitted questions online? Okay, quite a number of you have. So, there's been a number of questions that have come through, uh, and I would reshare the link and the login if anyone wishes it, but we've had good conversations so far this morning. I'll, I'll go through and answer the questions that have come through online. You're welcome to add any more. Um, and there's a link in your program book if you would like to add more, if you, do, if you want to ask questions anonymously. And once we're through the questions that I have here, then I'll just go through and we'll have an open Q&A and uh, we'll continue <clears throat> with any questions, follow-up questions that you might have. So. A lot of questions have come through just in the last few hours. I haven't reviewed all of them. It would be nice if I had a moderator, but I will go through this. So uh, the first question that is here is, um, you are a I can manage. I'm technically supposed to volunteer. So. You're technically supposed to volunteer? At some point. <laughs> I'll give this to one of you. <laughs> you can figure it out. Um, <clears throat> So the first question that I recall was uh, regarding inoculants. How can we select the, how do we know we have the right inoculant and what are the best ways to apply it? Unfortunately, there aren't any general purpose, one size fits all inoculants that I am aware of. And there are different types of inoculants that are very important and necessary. I'll make some very broad generalizations on, and I will... So, in, in our consulting work at AEA, we use a lot of inoculants because many of the commercial growers that we work with don't have the bandwidth, the time, the energy, or the desire to produce compost and compost tea. And in those types of situations, far too many times we see that compost, the quality of the compost tea produced is atrocious. And uh, so compost tea can be, uh, I would say that that is kind of the ultimate inoculant because it, when well produced, well, well designed, it can contain the fungi and the bacteria and the actinomycetes and the algae and, and all the different organisms that you need to really regenerate a soil fast the uh, soil's microbial population. The challenge is that compost tea is inherently so variable and on many farming operations we've found, we have found that many of the larger scale farms are better off not even trying to produce compost tea because the product they produce ends up being of such poor quality. So because of that we use a lot of purchased uh, inoculants and so I would say and I'm, I'm kind of riffing off the top of my head on this answer just based on the experience and the practice that we use. So we, we, do, we have kind of three different types of inoculants that I would recommend. One is a bacterial inoculant. So just a bacterial inoculant in general to supply the endophytes that we spoke of and, and a plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Um, the one that we use, which I think many of you are familiar with, is a product called Spectrum, which is manufactured by Tinyo Technology. And... Um, then the, the second inoculant that I would suggest everyone use is a mycorrhizal fungi. Um, those are generally specific. We actually created a version or uh, product of our own called BioCoat Gold that contains both the bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi together. And in my opinion, from what I've observed, every single crop needs to be inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, even those crops which people say are not mycorrhizae associated because despite the science, every time we apply a mycorrhizal fungal inoculant on those crops, we get a significant crop response, particularly in stressed environments. So when we have stressed environments with high salt levels in the soil or um, high concentrations of salt fertilizers, the, those plants that have had mycorrhizal fungi uh, put on at planting respond much better than those that have not. And I don't have an explanation for why that is, I just know that it happens. The third inoculant, or the third type of inoculant that I would suggest is if you have a specific pathogen or disease or insect that is causing problems, it is 
increasingly possible today to identify specific organisms and purchase specific inoculants for a specific problem. And I'll give two examples that we use frequently or relatively frequently. The one is when you have challenges with insects, which are fairly localized, they don't migrate over large areas, that have a soil stage. In other words, they pupate in the soil or uh, the eggs are laid in the soil. You can have an impact on those insects because the, either the pupa or the eggshell is composed of a material called chitin. And there are many bacteria in the soil profile that you can also purchase as inoculants that are chitin digesting bacteria. And they will actually consume either the eggs or the pupa of insect or insect eggs that are in the soil profile. The second possibility or second organism that I believe should be used much more widely, much more often is trichoderma. Um, so you should think of trichoderma inoculants a bit in the same regard. They're, they're, they're different, but there are the different species of trichoderma that associate or that do a better job with different plants similar to mycorrhizae. So we know that some mycorrhizae are plant specific. Um, also trichoderma do better on some crops than on others. And Trichoderma have a reputation when you get a viable inoculant that is actually effective, you apply it to the soil. Um, they have a reputation of being so aggressive that they outconsume and outcompete other soil fungal populations, including mycorrhizal fungi and others. And many times I've been asked the question, well, isn't the trichoderma going to be a problem? because it outcompetes everything else. I want a diverse soil microbial population. So if I want diversity, then therefore tri trichoderma is not a good idea because it's going to outcompete everything else. That isn't something you should need to be concerned about because if the trichoderma proliferates to such an extraordinary degree that it becomes the dominant population, that is because that only happens because the soil was so degraded from a microbial perspective in the first place. So you can think of the trichoderma almost being as, as being a fungal pioneering species, and that as the microbial population that soil evolves and associated with trichoderma, the trichoderma over a period of a few years is going to fade away. And in the meantime, you've taken care of your Fusarium or Phytophthora verticillium challenges. Um, so that was the first part of the question. The second part of the question was, how do you apply it to get the most uh, responses? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, also, you know, how do we know that this jug or, or bag is viable when we receive it? I mean, I guess you need a microscope to do that, right? But, um, but you know, is there certain companies or certain products? I know yours are the best. <laughs> I'm really glad. I'm, 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 I'm really glad we've got that figured out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you, here you buy this stuff. Is it alive? Is it, yep. you, know, you know, how do you keep it alive from where you produce it yep. to the end user? <coughs> Does it, um, maybe it's not art, maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, the universities in my area say that they tested 10 products and they were all yep. not good. Yeah. So that was like, whoa, I don't want yep. to waste my money. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's no simple answer to that question. Um, there historically have been entirely too many products in the marketplace that were not viable. And uh, the, the good news is that in the future, there, there is legislation evolving. Are you here in the US? Yeah, not Oregon. Oregon. There is legislation evolving that uh, we expect in the next couple of years for there. Right now, if, if a company wants to manufacture a product, a microbial product, and put it in the marketplace, there's essentially, uh, there's, there's four possible categories. It can be a soil amendment. It can be a crop fertilizer. It can be a pesticide. And what's the fourth one? I'm sorry? We don't yet have biostimulants legislation or a regulatory framework here. So there is 
a regulatory framework being developed here for biostimulants and biocontrols, which will set standards and define standards where companies, because right now the microbial inoculants that we use, we don't manufacture them, but they're labeled as a soil amendment because that's the only category, they're not uh, pesticide, even though if, if they actually take those products to Europe, they, are, they then have to register them there as a biocontrol product, as a biopesticide because of some of the organisms that it contains, which is really interesting. But um, so, so to answer your question uh, from a practical perspective, um, there's, there's two points. The universities that measured the products that you described said that they didn't contain any living organisms. And certainly not one to dispute that, but the question that really needs to be asked is not whether they contain live organisms or not, but what was the effect that they had on the crop? Because we've actually observed a, a number of products who didn't have live or organisms, a number of trichoderma products have had this problem. They did not contain live organisms, but when we put them on the soil, because of the metabolites that they contained, they triggered the growth of the organisms that they were intended to quote unquote inoculate. So we in fact got very good trichoderma populations from a product that in the laboratory appeared to have no living trichoderma in it. Don't ask me how that works either. <laughs> yes. May I add to that? Please. <clears throat> we are from Europe, we are pretty strict in our rules and uh, we do produce bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi. Um, First of all, uh, I believe that manufacturers should, should put on the label what's in it and how much of it. And the fact that universities are not able to analyze what's inside is that they don't, most of the time, they don't have the right tracers to mm -hmm. fight these bacteria. Yep. So they take common agar and they say, well, it doesn't work. And yep. so, right, they're not, how do you, it's a soil bacteria, right? So if you, yeah. if you deliver products like that, I would say uh, let them research by university, but the manufacturer has to provide the right primers to enable the universities to analyze them. And that doesn't happen yet. Yep. Thank you for that additional point. So where and when and how do you use them? You get them into as close proximity to the root system as you can. The earlier in the plant's life cycle, the better. The more frequently, the better. Um, that's kind of the general overview. Uh, um, broad acre crops that we work with, we often will do a single or perhaps one additional application in, in season, uh, but we'll often do a single application at planting in furrow. On our fruit and vegetable crops, particularly for crops that are in challenged environments with challenged soils, where they have any type of soil challenge, whether it might be a high salt content or um, historical herbicide load, or if we have high nutrient concentrates that we're trying to remediate, we will actually spoon feed in the irrigation system with an inoculant through the growing season. And the results that we get when we have a good inoculant, we do that consistently, are generally considered in the unbelievable category. It's probably the one, one of the more powerful management tools is consistent microbial applications through the growing season. Yep. I'm sure you agree. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so for compost tea, yeah, the same is true of compost tea. Uh, first apply it in furrow at planting, and then if you have the capacity, as many times as possible through the irrigation se uh, through the season in the irrigation system. And remember that what biology need to thrive is they need enough water, they need enough oxygen, and or I should say air exchange and gas exchange, not necessarily oxygen, and they need a food source. They need sugar. So when you have, they will actually thrive best when you have growing plants, and occasionally when you use biostimulants to, um, and even potential food sources in the irrigation system to give them an additional shot. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you a, um, what's the right word? a non-standard answer to that question. Um, if you want to develop soil profiles that have an abundance of fungi, fungus that are fungi dominated, or if you want to narrow the bacterial to fungal biomass ratios, you need to stimulate bacteria. Because the fungi will feed on 
the bacterial metabolites, the bacterial populations, and when you stimulate bacteria, the fungi will grow on and develop on their own. This has been my experience, and there are many who talk about applying fungal food sources, such as applying, applying humic acids or applying fish oil uh, to stimulate fungal populations when you have a too narrow a ratio between bacterial biomass and fungal biomass. The challenge is that often they're looking only at the ratio, but both the bacterial biomass and the fungal biomass are all the way down here, and we need to have them all the way up here. So first, when you start building the bacterial population, the bacterial biomass quantity increases. It's been our observation experience that the fungal population then comes up right behind it as well. So I do microscope sets in Stella Inc. Yep. And in a really bad Florida soil where I'm from, so I always see really high bacterial levels and nothing for everything, maybe some bad fungi. That's what I see. So when, you're, but when you, you want to add more bacteria, even though you've already got elevated levels. Let me, let me give you an example of um, what we've observed. <clears throat> We work with a blueberry grower who monitors his ericoid mycorrhizal con uh, root colonization every 14 days throughout the entire growing season. And often when, particularly on the more challenged soils on his farm, this is several hundred acres of blueberries, often when you get to the fruit filling stage, the plant begins moving the majority of its sugars into the fruit and no longer has enough sugars to sustain both the fruit and to move sugars down to the root system. So when that happens, the ericoid mycorrhizal population starts dropping off. His target is to constantly have at least 60% colonization uh, when measured in the laboratory, and uh, he'll start seeing that dropping off long before you can see anything happening with the berries of the plant. So he uses that as an indicator to say that um, the, the plant is no longer, no longer has an abundance of energy, and he begins feeding the plants much more aggressively with foliar sprays of nutrients and so forth. But for the soil, for the ericoid mycorrhizal fungi, his treatment of choice that he's found to be the most effective is uh, his operation is set up with overhead pivots and uh, he will pivot irrigate two gallons per acre of molasses, which is a bacterial food. And within 10 to 14 days of the molasses application, the ericoid mycorrhizal population goes right back up to where it was or higher. So that's one observation, and we have had a number of those uh, like those. So that's why I've had that perspective that if you want to stimulate fungi, you need to stimulate bacteria, and they provide a substrate in an environment in which the fungi, fungi can thrive. I am not a microbiologist. I don't have the experience and the credentials that Elaine does and that other people do. So I'm certainly open to input and discovering something different. But that's, that's been my practical field experience of how we've approached it. <laughs> Have I found a microbiologist that agrees? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> with all due respect for Elaine Ingham, um, and I mean this sincerely, and I do respect her. I had her a couple of times in the Netherlands, but she knows more about bacteria than about fungi, and she doesn't really mix that up. But there's not a fungus that can live without bacteria. Yeah. And the other way around. Yeah. Good. Yes. I'm taking questions from the very beginning and the very end. Okay. Please explain more about the solar discoveries being made about plants and what is fine for feeding angle. Oh, um, so this is probably coming from my presentation this morning. So the question was um, can I explain more about solar radiation and the phi angle? Is that specifically? So um, the short answer is no. I can't explain it well enough here in this presentation. Uh, I would suggest that you go to the website Space Weather News uh, and, and look up. They have lots of educational videos and materials on what's happening with uh, solar radiation, and what it really means. And uh, I think you will find it fascinating. So I'm not going to try to explain it right now. Yes? A uh, question about an observation in my field. I have blueberries, three acres, and um, I have basically never sprayed them. I have the blueberries in, um, we, we prepared the soil ahead of time in terms of pH, so it was in a pretty good place. We're irrigating from a pond that puts in about um, 5.0 pH, so it's not. <coughs> Um, we put chips down 
and through um, uh, drip irrigation, we also fertilize with um, organic gem, which is a liquid fish, and we usually add at least once a year a shot of um, liquid seaweed. So we plant. We started plant. We prepared and we started about a year, and then we planted our first berries in 2008. So we were going to keep going in terms of acreage until the spotted wing drosophila came along. So we put on the brakes and started to diversify with other things. But in the meantime, you know, I was being told we have to start thinking about spraying this and that. We don't use organic sprays either. So we check for spotted wing. We have a very tiny, we occasionally find a little bit. We're a Yupik farm. Nobody's freaked out. We hardly find a single egg of spotted wing drosophila or any signs of it. Of very few, very low. So can you explain that to me? <laughs> In terms of level of immunity, what's going on? Because there are spotted wing all over the place. <coughs> well, I, were you here in my discussion this morning, my presentation? So, um, should I have been here? Should I buy the book? We <laughs> read the transcript. Um, the conclusion, the conclusion of uh, one of our conversations this morning, one of the comments that I made is that um, we there there is no such thing as a pathogen. That these organisms that we perceive to be pathogens are only present because of a mismanaged ecosystem. So the the, the bottom line, very simply, is that when you have a plant that is healthy enough. Um, the spotted wing drosophila larvae cannot use it as a food source. And even if eggs are laid, and even when eggs are present, when they hatch, they die, because they cannot utilize the forms of carbohydrates and peptides that are present in the food, er, in the berry, as a food source. Yeah. Yes, coming back to you for a question. Alternatives for herbicides. Um, All of the alternatives to herbicides really relate to cultural management. And I'll, I'm just going to repeat the statement again that we made a moment ago, that there is no such thing as a pathogen. It's only in how we manage the ecosystem. And the same is true of weeds. There is no such thing really as a weed. We, we determine which plants are present based on how we manage the soil ecosystem. So um, it is possible through cultural management to develop soils that not that don't contain a weed seed bank, that's not the objective. The objective is to obtain, to develop soil health profiles that even though weed seeds are present, the environment is not optimum for them to germinate. And the one organism that has a gizzard and consumes weed seeds in extraordinary quantities is an earthworm. And you actually you look at some of the research of how many seeds an earthworm can consume, they can uh, they could, when supported and given the right environment and given a good earthworm population, you could, con you could conceivably develop a topsoil profile that was completely weed-free in a matter of a year or two. And I've actually observed farms where that has happened successfully on a scale of hundreds of acres. It can happen. It's a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So... How should we think about using different types of mulches, plastic mulch, um, straw mulch, et cetera, in, in developing biology and thinking about gas exchange? Um, again, speaking from experience, I, I'm puzzled about what we have observed. I don't know the answer entirely, but um, when crops are grown on plastic mulch, with drip irrigation, and the soil environment underneath that plastic mulch is well managed with moisture, those seem to be the optimal ecosystems for soil biology. They thrive and proliferate in ways that must be seen to be observed, to be believed. Um, and it's been my observation that those environments actually produce more abundant microbial populations than under straw or hay mulch. And I suspect a part of that is because of higher soil temperatures and being a warmer soil environment. Thinking about gas exchange as well, um, 
we immediately think about, well, these plants need to have adequate carbon dioxide coming from the soil profile. How are we getting enough CO2 and how are we getting good enough gas exchange to sustain the soil microbial population when the soil is covered by a sheet of plastic? I don't know the answer to that question. But what I do know is that both the biology and the plants seem to thrive to an extraordinary degree in that environment. Gas exchange doesn't seem to be a problem. Yes. I have a suggestion just for my observation this year. But yes. Many acres of hemp under plot of, in plastic that, you know, you, they took, we tear a little hole mm -hmm. about this big around each plant and it seems to breathe. Yes, so, it does. So if, you, if you're losing CO2 from the saw that you just planted into, it's coming right up underneath that plant. Um, is, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking that that's happening because it is amazing that they did, you know, it does work. We had it seems to breathe, I mean. It does breathe. It, there is no question based on how the plants are responding, how the biology is responding, it does breathe and it seems to breathe enough. Um, now, we had a conversation earlier about the downsides of plastic and it, I certainly believe that it should be our desire to get to a point where we don't need or don't benefit from plastic mulch anymore, and I do believe that is possible. So one of the things, that one of the um, environmental parameters that needs to be in place is we need to have such vigorous soil biology that our soil is warm in the spring and warm during the winter months. And when you have that, you have less of, an, of a benefit with plastic when plastic is used in the spring to start crops early. So there's actually, I'm sure many of you may have seen the photos. I've, I've seen a number of photos from growers on the Great Plains and the High Plains in the Midwest who have been using biological practices for a year or two and you see this plain covered with snow and here is a field where all the snow has melted and it's January. And it's green. And it's green. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. So how much more quickly do you think that soil is going to warm up in April and May because of that good biological activity? Yeah. So a question on compost tea extracts and application. I actually think we covered that question already earlier when we spoke about biological inoculants. Yeah. Is the pr so the question was uh, desiring to help regenerative agriculture without being a farmer. Is the person in the room who asked that question? Would you mind elaborating on it a little bit? Well, part one is you can support those very closely who are. Yes, Julie, yeah, go ahead. I just think I'm, I'm, I run an organic farming organization, and what we need is for all consumers to start saying to all farmers and who they respectively are going to buy from, how did you raise the food? What do you know about carbon sequestration? What's your organic matter? You know, what kind of chemicals are you using? All these kinds of things, and really in interview your farmer. How does your food taste? Do you know about food quality, those kind of things? And when you all start demanding that from the farmers, then just like the universities are you know, starting to follow these movements, those farmers are going to say, geez, i got to get on this. So maybe if your answer is try to help get other consumers to do this too. That's well, something I already do on my one-on-one -on -one basis. Well, yeah, but yes, I mean, and if you live in Massachusetts, we should talk. Oh, no, that's close enough. I mean, I, you know, I think there's people, we need consumers to really be pushing this movement. That's yeah. how it's going to happen. Not just in, more, than, more than farmers, we need consumers to push this. And not just as an individual consumer, but also with the, uh, with the knowledge and the skills that you have as organizations, organizationally. Um, there are a lot of organizations that need to support farmers. <laughs> Maybe uh, if you want to pay your, your uh, school debt, maybe you need to become a farmer. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't joking, by the way. <laughs> well, we laughed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, I'm 
sorry I missed your first talk and maybe you really went over this, but you, know, you talked a lot about uh, foliar amendments. And I'm curious if you feel that, uh, and we'll say an intensive market garden can get to the point where that's really unnecessary and that the soil system really is working, or do you feel like there's always going to be another 10 or 15 percent you can get, or 5 percent, through the skillful use of, of those kind of foliar amendments? So there is a question of, of managing to the optimum versus managing to, to at the sustainable threshold. So I would say that, first of all, it, it is absolutely possible to use foliar applications and to use good management to develop the overall ecosystem to a point that is so vibrant and so healthy that you are not dependent on using foliar applications, that you're not dependent on using microbial inoculants, that you don't need them past that threshold anymore because you've achieved such a state of soil health. That is absolutely possible. And my experience has been that when you get past that threshold of vibrant health, there is, it is still possible to get additional yield and quality responses past that threshold with foliar sprays if you desire to do so. So there are some growers who are always striving to get to the next level, always be a little bit better. And then there are some growers who once they're across that threshold, they say, life is good, it's flowing, I don't need anything more, I'm happy, let's just go with what works. And so it's really a question of personal desire. You can go in either direction. You, you have the liberty to choose at that point. Do I think that foliars can suppress the ecology or shift the ecology in a negative way? Yeah. Um, no, I don't. And I don't believe they can suppress it negatively because what is actually happening with a foliar is that we are stimulating the plant to increase photosynthesis to a higher level and then the plant is selecting and making the decision the informed intelligent decision about what photosynthates it wants to send out to the root system. So you're actually enhancing the direction that the ecology should be moving in rather than having a negative impact. Yeah, that's a very good question though, yes. When I, when I talk about being dependent on those tools, I am basically describing a state where the plants are not yet resistant to all diseases and all insects. That's my threshold of overall ecosystem health. When you no longer have quote unquote pathogens, your system is flowing and working and you're not dependent on management practices and inputs to try to shift things and bring them into a different environment or into a different state. So it's not, you're not dependent on them in the sense that you're drug addicted or anything like that, but that you still require those interventions to cross that threshold of health. You were here this morning for a conversation. Okay. So look at the science of endocytosis. And endocytosis is basically, I described it briefly, it's the capacity of a cell to surround a macromolecule and absorb and, and um, internalize the entire molecule. So plants don't absorb any appreciable quantities of nutrients through the stomata. It's actually uh, internalized directly into the cells on the plant leaf surface. So the question was, uh, in, uh, re going back to the comments about the negative impact of, of fertilizers on the soil ecology, and is it possible for organic fertilizers to also have that negative impact on ecology? And the answer is yes. For some organic fertilizers, um, so, Generally, for any refined fertilizer, there is the potential to be a negative, such as elemental sulfur, such as chilean nitrate, for example. Those have the potential to be a negative to the soil ecology. When you're speaking about biological type materials, such as compost, we generally wouldn't think of compost as having a negative effect on ecology, but it can when it supplies an excess of nutrient. So if you already have high potassium levels in your soil, let's say high phosphorus levels, and you put on ever more compost applications that continue to elevate the phosphorus levels higher and higher, they will absolutely have a significant negative effect on the soil ecology. They will suppress the development of mycorrhizal fungi and other phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. So it's possible to use compost or any organic material to excess, absolutely. Contentious perspectives.
that's an appropriate phrase for some of the things that I say. Uh, <laughs> so the question was on honeybees. Regenerative agriculture has been credited with the um, resurgence of honeybee populations. And any thoughts that I might have around that? Um, not really. In my opinion, we haven't yet really observed a resurgence of honeybee populations. I mean, you have to ask the question of what time window are you looking at? And my passion is my is beekeeping. I had originally dreamed of becoming a beekeeper. When you go back to the 19, I, I want to say, I used to know all this data, 1960, there were 80 million colonies of honeybees in the United States. By 1980, they had dropped to 20 million colonies. By the 1990, they were down to 10 million colonies. Today, where, or the last that I was aware of the data, which was a couple of years ago, we were down the neighborhood of 2 million colonies. So if we've had a resurgence from 2 million colonies to 2.2 million colonies, I wouldn't say that we've had any resurgence yet at this point. Um, but there is something else we have to consider as well, which is that um, honeybees are considered to be the canary in the, gold, in the coal mine. And yes, they certainly are indicators of the systemic insecticides and fungicides that have been used on crops that are being accumulated in their colonies. They are an indicator of the challenges. However, um, honeybees are not native to North America. And we have a lot of other native pollinators that I personally have observed in many of the farms that we work with as honeybee populations have declined, the native, populator pop, native pollinator populations have increased to balance that out. So um, there's silver lining to that cloud. Uh, actually, I, th I think I'm going to take that computer back. Just I'm going to read the questions aloud because I have on audio. Um, but thank you for all that you've done so far. So the question was, um, algae in soil as a photosynthesizing organism, would there be value in applying algae in foliar applications? So. Um, I've mentioned algae in a few conversations that I've had in a few presentations, and I'm glad that they're getting more attention. Algae, from my understanding, algae are to soil what plankton is to the ocean. They are kind of the foundational photosynthesizing organism that many, they're the foundation of the trophic cascade, if you will. And algae can photosynthesize in the soil up to well, I actually don't want to put a limit on it because I'm not sure what the limit is in terms of depth. We know that they can, they can uh, photosynthesize on the surface, in the, in the surface couple inches of the soil because of infrared radiation. But deeper down the soil profile, they can also photosynthesize because of photons of light emitted from paramagnetic rock. And they can also photosynthesize from photons of light emitted from root systems. So. Don't imagine that soils are dark places. There's actually a lot of photons of light moving around in soil environments that algae can collect and use to photosynthesize um, as deep as we have good gas exchange, essentially. So algae, of course, are single-celled plants. And they're amongst the first population to disappear when we start loading soils with herbicides. So one of the effects that we've observed, I described the microbial inoculant, I mentioned the microbial inoculant earlier that we have uh, been working with to remediate hydrocarbons and remove pesticides from the soil environment. And we, when we are, when we apply this inoculant, we are seeing tremendous nitrogen responses and phosphorus responses in plants, increased nitrogen and phosphorus absorption to the point where we've been growing a few crops that are considered, uh, such as brassicas, considered to be very nitrogen, uh, have very high nitrogen, nitrogen requirements with no additional applied nitrogen. And soils that we wouldn't consider historically to have been really great soils from a microbial perspective. Algae, during the photosynthesis process, not only are they photosynthesizing, but of course they need nitrogen to form their own cells. And they're at the foundation of the trophic cascade. So we've been getting as much as 80 to 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen response equivalent from having abundant algae populations in the soil profile. So I'm actually very excited about the potential that algae has. And of course, 
one of the first requirements, it seems, based on our experience, to develop those populations that we need to remove the herbicide load in the soil profile. And uh, so to the question directly about putting those on as foliar applications, um, there are photosynthetic algae that live uh, on the plant leaf surface. Um, we've experimented with a few products who have have used those and we have not yet observed a significant crop response. So there are a number of products that have photosynthetic algae, uh, purple algae that colonize plant surfaces and there's something that we don't yet know about managing them or perhaps that they are already present and doing their job. Um, question on should we give plants optimal water whenever necessary or should we consider letting them dry out and experience some drought stress to encourage deeper root growth? Um, I can answer this really simply. Our objective should be to give plants an optimal environment all the time. I do not believe that stressing plants has any productive outcome for yield or quality as long as plants have good nutrition. So when you're growing plants in a conventional system, in a conventional nutritional model where you have high levels of soluble nitrogen, high levels of soluble potassium, you end up, and there can be any number of contributing factors here, but you can end up with a plant that has weak watery cells and that isn't healthy. So for those healthy plants, those healthy plants will indeed benefit from being stressed. They will grow more roots from being stressed. But when you have good biology and well-balanced nutrition, eliminate as much stress as possible. We actually have vegetable growers that we've been working with um, who have discontinued the use of hardening off their seedlings. They're taking seedlings straight from the greenhouse out into the field and they're with no transplant shock and no stress of any type and they're able to do that successfully because they have seedlings which have a very high calcium content and low nitrogen, low potassium content and as a result they're, they grew very quickly. These seedlings uh, instead of taking six or eight weeks to grow they might have grown them in 50 to 60 percent of the time, three to four week growth period. So they grew them very quickly with an optimal environment but with high calcium levels so now they're short they're stocky, they have a very th thick stem, and they have very strong cells and very strong cell membranes. They don't have the weak, watery cells that a seedling does that is grown with high levels of nitrogen, high levels of potassium. So if you grow a high quality plant, there are no benefits to stressing them. Is that because of the potting mix or something that's added to it? Like We've completely changed the potting mix. The old potting mix had to get thrown out and we start over with a brand new formula. Uh, there's a company in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania called Keystone Bioag that makes the one that we recommend our growers to use. And typically, they will cut down. Uh, so you have to understand you have to manage this media completely differently from a watering perspective because water doesn't move, nearly, doesn't move through nearly as quickly as it does with other potting media. So understand that you have to manage water differently and expect to grow seedlings in about 60 to 70 percent of the time or less as you normally would. So that cuts down significantly in your greenhouse heating bill. Is organic? It is organically certified, yes. Say the name one more time. Keystone Bioag. 717-354-2115. It's called Keystone Soil Media. That's it. It doesn't even have a name that I'm aware of. Uh, they balance the nutrition completely differently. It's got high calcium levels, it's got low nitrogen, it's got low potassium, it has, it's already been pre inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria and all types of different other, it contains humified compost, humic substances, clay complexes, and a list of about 40 ingredients. I helped put it together, so. <laughs> they don't have a website, which is why I gave you their number. Yeah. You want me to give that number again? 717? 354-2115. The laboratory that's actually doing the analysis is uh, called Nova Crop Control, which is in the Netherlands. The, the um, organization that is 
aggregating all the samples in North America is called Crop Health Labs, um, based in Ohio, which I helped start. And essentially what Crop Health Labs is doing is they are assembling all the samples, or many of the samples, in the United States and overnight exporting them to the Netherlands. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow. Can I ask an earthworm question? Can I go back to that? Of course. Weed seed control question. Um, any earthworm species being non-native, which is its own question. Um, I've, I've paraphrased you in the past with uh, you know, weed, weed control or undesired uh, vegetation control is best resolved with presence, simple presence. Absence is not presence. Where that's so that's so that's that's my contribution. The earthworms, though, where do they like peter out as a factor in as you get coastal, as you go from a high litter content and, and leafy, duffy, high mm -hmm. organic matter soils, mm -hmm. as you get more coastal and sandier and brinier, and, et cetera, where does the earthworm as, a, as an effective tool peter out, maybe using the Atlantic, using Massachusetts, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not qualified to answer the question. Um, but it's a, it's a good it's, it is a good question, and I, I have an observation actually around that to share, which is that um, the handful or so of soils that I've observed that have achieved a state of really high levels of biological activity, both soil or both bacterial and fungal and other organism activity, the earthworms are no longer present. Earthworms are a pioneering species, and when soils developed an optimal state, they move on somewhere else. This was, I think, if I recall correctly, first reported by the Lubkes in Austria, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so I think it is possible to do, and to your point, right, I think we should have an interesting conversation sometime about native populations because fully half of the crops that are more of the crops than that that we're growing in the U.S. are not native. Neither are honeybees, neither are earthworms, and they're all important. So at some point, they become native, and now they're native. So that's a done conversation anymore. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I say presence. I mean, I don't, I don't generally try to eradicate invasive yeah. or non-native plants. I just want to keep them more stressed than the desired plants so that they never I have a very simple question for anyone who would advocate trying to eliminate invasive species. How many times has it been successful? Can I ask a totally separate question? Of course. You already did. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Soil, so I'm thinking uh, insects, let's call them undesirable insects or high impact. So non-native tick species and hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it helps manage their northward spread if the soil goes through a freeze cycle to, to good depth. So when you talked about, so I got a little bit confused when you talked about keeping soil warm mm -hmm. like throughout the year. The, mm -hmm. the image is clear, the green field in January in Minnesota or whatever. The counterpoint to that would be, does that enable ticks and hemlock woolly adelgid? That's a good question, and again, I don't know. Uh, the question that I would ask, though, is that those warm soils that I described are at a state of extraordinary biological activity. What is the impact of that biology on those organisms that you mentioned? Um, and by the way, also, I really appreciate your careful choice of words because there are a few words that I very much dislike using. Weeds, pests, pathogens. If I could come up with a, a word that would describe the presence of these organisms, because that definition exists only in our mind. That's something that we made up. So thank you for that. Well, there's no, there's no quote. It's not, it doesn't come from you. It comes from, it's got to go to someone else, and I don't have the name on the tip of my tongue, but they said there's no right or wrong in nature, only consequence. So I think the ideal word for weeds or invasives, someone said to me, they're just inconvenient species. But I think we achieve better balance and maybe a more desirable functional ecosystems if we move this conversation regenerative. It's, somebody was asking, what can they do to support regenerative agriculture? And I would say, regenerative agriculture, yes, we're, we're creating good food. That's one of the pillars. 
but there's nothing wrong with supporting regenerative landscape management, which Absolutely. means our forests and our non-ag spaces, even, even the courthouse lawn, could be managed in a more balanced and delicate manner that's not chem intensive. So support that kind of work, whether it's on the farm or not. That's actually an important comment, considering that um, the use of chemicals in landscaping actually exceeded the use of chemicals in agriculture, I think, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, two or three years. Last year. Yeah, it's fairly recently. Yes, Dave. Uh, to go back to the stress conversation for a minute, I'm always interested in how to get better tasting tomatoes. And obviously, there are, uh, you know, uh, shape and yeast type restaurants that are paying for dry land dry grown tomatoes because they taste better and I went to uh, Stone Barns and mm -hmm. I tasted their tomatoes and they had one variety that was just spectacular. I said, whoa, what are those? And they, they said, Matthew. And I said, I grow Matthew. They're not very good. Mm -hmm. so, but they're growing in a desert. I was like amazed at how dry yep. they were growing. So I'm yep. just curious, like, are you feeling that, that um, if they had got their soil right, could have the same flavor but better production. Yes. Yes. You get to a high enough level. What if you had a Matthews tomato that was uh, in an optimal ecosystem that had a bricks of, I'm making it up, let's say 22? Yes. Would that have the same flavor profile? It probably would have a slightly different but equally high quality or even higher quality flavor profile as what you experienced. So here's what we've observed. You know, the one crop that they measured the production of aromatic compounds very reliably and consistently is cannabis. And there's some oil crops as well, but cannabis in particular. So here's what we've observed. Um, on the vertical axis, I'm, well, the marker will allow me. Um, on the vertical axis, we will have photosynthetic efficiency. And we'll call this 100% at the top of the scale and zero at the bottom. And here, uh, then I will match this with, how can I describe this? So I'm going to graph out plant biomass and the production of, of plant secondary metabolites, all these aromatic compounds relative to photosynthesis. So you have a plant that what is common today in production agriculture is about 10% photosynthetic efficiency. So we'll start here. So when you have a plant at 10% photosynthetic efficiency, the biomass levels are going to be, actually let's start at 5%. We'll say this number, this is at 5% photosynthetic efficiency. That's the stress plant being grown in drought conditions. It's at about 5% photosynthetic efficiency. So the biomass level is here. And then when you take that plant and commercial growers of either tomatoes or sage or mint or any crops where they desire high concentrations of these aromatic compounds produce these stress plants by either water deprivation nitrogen deprivation or phosphorus deprivation. Those are the three tools that are most commonly used to limit biomass and to increase the formation of these compounds. So let's say you remove that barrier and you, you add adequate water, nitrogen, or phosphorus. Now the photosynthesis levels, will say, go up to about, we'll say, 20%. And so that is the level of functioning of what we consider to be commercial agriculture. That's standard agriculture. When that happens, you go from here up here. Your biomass levels really increase. So your biomass levels are now here. And now I wish I had a different color marker, but I don't. So um, what happens here, we'll build a second line that we'll call plant secondary metabolites. So the PSMs are here. So when you have a low level of biomass, you have high levels of PSMs. Then when you, get, when you move from 5% to 20% photosynthetic efficiency, your biomass goes up, but your production of PSMs goes down, and they cross. And that has been the perception, that has been the explanation of, of, the, of the idea of the interaction between plant biomass and growth and the secondary metabolite concentration. 
but they stopped too soon. This chart, what happens now when you go from 20% photosynthetic efficiency up to, let's say, 40%, is that your biomass goes up another notch, like so, but your plant secondary metabolite line goes like this. And it crosses the biomass production, and you have a significantly higher concentration of plant secondary metabolites at this point than you do at this point. And if you don't believe that, try to convince any cannabis grower under the sun to stress their crop. <laughs> They're never going to stress their plants because they know that the highest levels of, of cannabinoids they can possibly produce occur in an optimal environment. They do everything they can, optimal lighting, water, CO2, and optimal nutrition to produce this type of ecosystem, and this type of response. So for those of you who didn't hear the question, the question was, uh, if we manage plant nutrition in such a manner to produce these higher levels of plant secondary metabolites, how will that influence the plant's relationship with uh, beneficial or symbiotic organisms such as beneficial insects or beneficial bacteria? Was that your question? I'm so paraphrasing. I guess it's going to be the soil microbiology, maybe not the focus. So specifically soil microbiology. Um, I liked the first question better. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think it is important to speak to the role of beneficial insects, then I'll try to answer your question as well. So probably nine or 10 years ago now, I started working with a grape tomato high tunnel grower in Pennsylvania who was extremely proud of his naturally developed populations of beneficial insects. They had done some initial inoculation and then uh, allowed them to just proliferate and over a several season period and he had his grape tomato high tunnels, and all the tomato leaves would have multiple beneficial insects on them, 10, 15, 20. It was really extraordinary to observe. It was a very interesting situation. We started working with him, started managing plant nutrition a little bit differently, and in two years, his beneficial population completely disappeared. His beneficials were gone. There were no longer any beneficial insects left. He was a bit dismayed, but the reason they were gone is because there was no longer food supply left for them. The infectious disease, uh, insects that they were feeding on were no longer present. And so the beneficials no longer had a food source. So um, in, in the context of, to, to your question about soil microbiology, um, I don't know the exact answer. But what I do know, or at least I think I know, is that biology is required to form this. You will not get these elevated levels of plant secondary metabolites without first having an abundant microbial population in the rhizosphere because they actually trigger the ISR and SAR pathways that lead to the formation of these compounds. So there are many organisms that actually trigger the production of these plant secondary metabolites. But if there are no insects, what are the birds going it's like if you have food that only can serve one species, and that's us, the insects can't touch it. That means the, the, the rest of the so the above ground food web depends on those insects is also not feeding the entire block that's food just for us. That doesn't sound like a healthy ecosystem. Uh, we've got a long ways to go before we get to that extreme scenario. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we used to. Um, and this is the point that you made is the reason why I'm as excited as I am about the development of the meter that Dan is developing to be able to measure this in the field in real time. Um, so we used to use the Horiba meters to measure, well, the entire array of what was available to measure nitrate, uh, potassium, calcium, et cetera, pH, electrical conductivity breaks. And the challenge that we ran into is that they are calibrated for a certain level of plant health. And when you cross the threshold of that plant health, the numbers no longer made sense. And this was true particularly for calcium and potassium and nitrate. And I'll give you an example of what happened with nitrate. Uh, we would have plants that showed us the nitrate readings. We'd get a certain level of nitrate readings of what was considered optimal nitrogen. And then all of a sudden, 
nitrate levels would go to zero, and yet we still have a crop that obviously still has an abundance of nitrogen. It's dark green, it's growing well. And what was actually happening is the plants became healthy enough, they had the proper nutritional balance that they began converting all of the nitrate that they had absorbed into peptides and proteins. And the nitrate levels in the sap went to zero, and yet the plants still had abundant levels of total nitrogen that sustained themselves for an entire season. So that is one of the, was one of the reasons why we switched away from using those meters to using the sap analysis. I think they're a useful tool. They're a useful tool to learn as an interim tool, but that was the downside that we discovered. Um, there are instruments that measure it. I know the name of the instrument, but it's escaping my mind at the moment. Um, researchers use them all the time. They go out in the field and they um, will attach a section of leaf into the instrument, still attached to the plant, preferably, and create a vacuum, pull all the gases out, then they will put in a given measured quantity of CO2 and expose the leaf to light and measure the gas exchange, how much CO2 is absorbed, how much oxygen is released, and they measure the photosynthetic rate in that manner actually happening within a leaf. It is observational, and the, the crude analog for it is a refractometer, a uh, Brix meter, and it is the key word being crude. It is a crude analog. It's not a perfect analog for it, but it does give us an indicator of what's happening on going on an overall level. Yeah. What percentage of the heavy metals in fish emulsion can be absorbed by transplants soaked in a solution? Um, I don't know. I've never measured it, and I'm not aware of anyone that has. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Um, organic fertilizers can stunt mycorrhizal growth. Short-term benefit, long-term trade-off of annual plants, and long-term soil health with fertilized transplanting. So I would say the only organic fertilizers that can, can stunt mycorrhizal uh, colonization that I'm aware of are uh, fertilizers which either have very high electrical conductivity, such as chili and nitrate, let's say, for example, or that have high levels of soluble phosphorus, um, which could be compost, conceivably. It can be poultry manure. And so I would, pref I would prefer to disassociate those applications. Don't, if you have, if, for whatever reason, let's say you have soils that need phosphorus supplementation, et cetera, um, don't put that soluble phosphorus application on at the same time as planting or in close proximity to the seed. Um, that's my understanding of materials that can limit mycorrhizae, and if there's any others, I would be happy to learn about them. John, just to go back to your last answer, I'm sorry, but yes. uh, if people are liquid feeding hydrolyzed soy protein, I'm not aware that they do because the the um, hydrolyzed soy protein nitrogen form is in the form of amino acids, not as a salt that has a negative impact on biology. Um, I'm not aware that it does. So let me make sure I understand correctly. They are doing deep compost applications with animal manure-based compost. In what quantities? Six inches of compost per acre. And what defines no, deep? No, uh, six inches deep. Yes. And six inches deep compost application per bed. So I think the question that has to be asked is, um, first of all, what are the levels of phosphorus that are present in the compost? What are the levels of phosphorus that are present in the soil? It's certainly possible to complex even substantially large quantities with, with humic substances, so if they have really well-developed compost, it's possible they could be sequestering and tying a lot of that up, but you would still think that a lot of it would be available, and yeah, if there are not challenges, then I would like to figure out what's going on. 30 years of Yeah, I don't have an answer for that one. Carl, do you? Well, they, they may be, but Carl just made a very appropriate point, right. is that it is very possible that the ultimate report card is what are the plants actually absorbing. It's entirely possible to have abundant levels of available phosphorus in the soil that the plants are absorbing and the laboratory tests show that they're low. So, so to, to, to solve that riddle, do I need to do plant sap, sap analysis? Yeah, you, or, or tissue analysis will show that to some degree as well. I believe plant sap analysis is better. but. Uh, yes, the plants are the final report card, and biology is the solution. So can biology in my parent soil 
is low in phosphorus. I mean, it doesn't seem like it matters when I look at the soil test in ratios. Mm -hmm. If I look at it in ratios, it always comes up low. What are the tests you're using? Well, I'm using Logan, and I'm, using, I'm starting to use the pace test too, but I'm just trying to work through that. Okay? Here's I, I'm learning, you know, I'm, it's a big riddle for me. So, can I, can the biology overcome the, so, the parent soil? I mean, the parent soil is, is what it is. Cool. Why? I think you, you're, you're operating. You're operating from a fundamental misconception, possibly, yeah. which is the idea that perhaps your parent soil is low in phosphorus. That's my, most, my most, my yeah. most soils in North, North America, not all, will have as much as six to 9,000 pounds of phosphorus locked up in the soil mineral matrix in the top six inches in the parent material. Right, I, and I've heard you say that. I've heard, um, I guess they, and, so our soils are sandy, 4% clay content. Okay. Um, you know, so they're not wonderful, great plains, you know, six foot deep things. Those don't exist anymore for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> so is that true or, you know, it's less true for sandy soils, but still more than you might expect. So I'd, I'd be happy to have a more in-depth conversation with you around that specifically. Um, but I would say, given the conversation we've had just in, this com uh, in our conversation this morning, if you're growing cannabis, then the rock phosphate is likely to be a really bad idea, and there are quite probable to be other better sources of addressing your phosphorus challenge. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm involved with other problems. An important question to ask, I don't know the answer because the various analytical methods are, are outside my area of expertise, but specifically what I would suggest is, first, there, there is quite a bit of information. If you go on to Google Scholar and you look for bioremediation of X, mercury, uh, there's a surprising amount of information available on these different elements of specific plants that bioaccumulate these materials and take them out of the soil system. And I would suggest that uh, you could grow those plants and also grow some vegetable crops that you want to harvest and actually send the plant to the laboratory and do a thorough analysis, not a plant sap analysis, but do a complete analysis of the total tissue to see what is present. Because, um, because of the activity of biology, because of the activity of humic substances, which you can add, and I would highly suggest adding humic substances, adding biology, it's entirely possible to have the presence of some of these toxic elements showing up in the soil profile and for plants to not absorb them. So again, the plants are the final report card. Yeah, Julie, I know you wanted to comment on that. No, I didn't. Oh, no? <laughs> I, wanted ask, I wanted to ask about my slugs. <laughs> Sorry. To the very, to the, I mean, I've been doing your stuff for a long time. Uh, we had, actually had some fields that jumped two um, percentage points on the soil organic matter this year. Um, wow. Yeah. Awesome. That is a lot of fun. Did you hear that? 2% of organic matter. Up to 12. Uh, amazing crop um, performance this year, but I still have slugs, and they're no longer big and uh, clear color. They're small and black. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you have any other thoughts about slugs. I'm getting down to the very, very few mm -hmm. remaining insect problems. <laughs> have you tried foliar applications of iron? Um, we have been adding iron, yeah. Maybe more. Huh? And what form? As a foliar. Yeah. I would like to dig into the data to be able to give you a specific, more helpful answer. Our experience has generally been that those growers who have applied enough iron have solved the problem. So there's a possibility you may not have applied enough, uh, but I don't know that without digging into it. And if you haven't, if you have applied enough and you still have slugs, then I also want to learn about it because I want to learn what else we might be able to do. Mm -hmm. So. Because they have a lot less vigor now than they did. <laughs> it's a helpful hypothesis for me standing here anyway. <laughs> I don't okay, we've got lots of questions here. Um, I'll go to you. So I just had a quick question going back to the bio gold. The first thing I want to I want to say is that using your products, uh, we're eleven thousand eight hundred square feet plantable. We went from thirty five hundred. 
pounds one year, two years later it's at 17,000. Um, and that's the kind of difference you've made for us. Wow. Uh, my, my question on the buy of gold is normally what I do when I get my seed packs is I put a pinch in every seed pack. But you stated that it's good to put it in the furrow and then add it as, as a foliar. Am I wasting my time putting it in the seed pack? No, no, that's a good spot to put it. I, I wouldn't necessarily, I, if I said applying it as a foliar, I misspoke. I wouldn't necessarily apply it as a foliar. Okay. Um, you can put it in the furrow, and we occasionally recommend putting it in the furrow in addition to a seed coat or maybe perhaps in place of a seed coat when you have really smooth seed that it doesn't want to stick to very well. Um, so that's a place where we might put it in. Like yeah, Good. something like that. Yes? Can you build uh, soil organic matter in warm climates and such water? There won't be some strategy. Um, I wouldn't desire to build soil organic matter in warm climates. Instead, I would seek to build as high levels of po as possible of microbially active carbon. So microbially active carbon is a fraction of soil organic matter. So think of it this way. It's possible to have, you can have high organic matter soil that has low levels of microbially active carbon and is essentially microbially sterile. An example would be a muck soil that has been treated with anhydrous ammonia. So that's a soil that's high organic matter, but no remaining microbially active carbon. Or the converse, as in your sandy soils, you can have soils that are extremely low in organic matter that maybe have only a half a percent, and have 100% of that half a percent be microbially active carbon. And that microbially active carbon then is enough to sustain a, an abundant and vigorous microbial population. Yeah. Yes. So I have a more broad question, um, but I just wanted to know if you think that like pure monoculture has a place in ecological or regenerative agriculture, and along those lines with like the mass scale conventional growers you talk about coming to you uh, for consulting, if you believe them converting to organ uh, sorry to regenerative methods. Um, how do we avoid like near input substitution and uh, maintaining the, the status quo of like the industrial system without like whole system ecological change? A mechanistic paradigm to plant nutrition is inherently going to fail in this approach. And so you, you asked a couple of different questions, but um, perhaps the best, I, I've used uh, Mike Omega, our cherry grower, as an example in, in the past when I've been here at the conference. And I'll use him again because of some of the things that his personal pathway, he's allowed us to share it, which some growers are averse to, many growers. Um, Mike was a completely conventional cherry grower and growing what you might consider to be a quote unquote monoculture of cherries, even though there is a diverse um, grass species on the orchard floor. But then, and he came to us, he said, I've heard that you can help me grow large firm cherries. I don't want to reduce pesticides. I don't believe that's possible. Um, I have no desire to become organic. Don't talk to me about reducing fertilizers. I don't want to do any of those things. I've heard that you can help me grow large firm cherries and that's what I want to do. So that was our first conversation with Mike. Three years later, at our annual review of what was happening on his farm, at this point, three years, Mike was very, he's very aggressive, very dedicated, very passionate about learning. At this point, three years later, he's doing compost applications on his entire orchard. He's mulching his entire orchard. He's growing diverse cover crops between the rows uh, during the summer months and uh, putting those cover crops on the, onto the tree row. Uh, he is mulching all of his prunings and putting them onto the tree row his operation has completely changed, his cultural management. And at the end of three years, at our annual review meeting, he said, you know, I told you in our first conversation that I have no desire to be organic, but I don't have bacterial canker anymore. I don't have powdery mildew anymore. I don't have spotted wing drosophila anymore. You know, if I wanted to, I could be organic. That, to me, <laughs> that... <laughs> That was, the real, that was a really rewarding conversation for me because that is precisely what we desire to accomplish in our relationship with growers is we want to help transition and shift their thinking and the way they approach growing a crop from a mechanistic to a cultural integrated perspective. 
I know you, a couple people have been waiting for a while, but. It's, uh, it's so how many acres does he have, and where does he locate? Um, the Dells, 370. Yeah, 370 acres. So I observed in California that you had a ton of growers there, the acres, and there's a lot of energy there and a lot of movement toward this. So, I mean, it's happening on a large scale. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know two people have been waiting with a question for a while, so I will be quick and then we'll wrap this up. Yes. Salt as in sodium chloride? Sulfur. Sulfur, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I, my old soil professor, Ray Wilder, he works around, always talks about sulfur. There's no true, reliable, good test for sulfur in soils. What are you recommending? What are you seeing out there as far as that element not being in the soil or being in the test more accurate? Um, so, I might have misunderstood your question. You're saying that it's low or that it's excessive? Low. It is low. Very low. Yes. We actually see that it is very low kind of consistently across the board because it is an anion. It tends to leach out of the soil profile until we build and get higher levels of organic matter and even microbially active carbon because organic matter and humic substances also have an anion exchange capacity, not just a cation exchange capacity. They can actually hold and stabilize anions such as sulfur and boron and molybdenum in the soil profile and keep them from leaching. So um, on here on the, uh, in the eastern United States, we actually have a rule of thumb that uh, we recommend growers to apply annually um, Rough, the, the equivalent of one pound of sulfur per inch of rainfall, because that is what is required to sustain sulfur levels in most soils, because that is what rainfall will leach out. Elemental, Elemental sulfur, yes. Or as in, are you asking about the application form? We, we will apply, we'll recommend one pound of actual sulfur, but our preference is to get that in the form of gypsum, for example, calcium sulfate rather than elemental sulfur. Occasionally, growers use elemental sulfur, but it's not our preferred. <laughs> All right, I'll be here for the rest of the day. If you have any follow-up questions, I'll be around. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.